This is Mike Perkins from Columbia College and welcome to my lecture on General Systems Theory. This lecture is an introduction to Systems Theory. Systems Theory is the dominant theoretical perspective in both social work and human services. Historically, Systems Theory is a successor to psychodynamic theory which predominated even into the 1960s as a paradigm for understanding the human condition. In simplest terms, systems theory is the idea that one thing affects another. The basic idea behind systems theory is that one thing affects another. Events and existence does not occur in a vacuum, but in relation to changing circumstances. Systems are dynamic and paradoxically try to retain their own integrity or their own boundaries while adapting to the inevitable change that's going on around them. A simplified form of systems theory can be found in the philosopher Heidegger's view of being. This German philosopher said that at any given time there are three major influences impacting our lives. They are, in the German, extens, facticity, and verfallen. Now we're going to take a look at what those are. Existence is the first concept that Heidegger uses. It is the pursuit of possibilities, doing things, moving around in the world. Humans are our first actors and livers. We care about our lives and our world. We try to accomplish things and do things. We try to build houses. We take exams. We pursue college degrees. We have people to love. We have fears to overcome. We have to face our own limitations and our own death. This is the concept of existence. Facticity is the second concept. That is bearing the weight of the past. Heidegger envisioned the past as being like this weight that bears down on us, that's affecting us at any given one time. What happened yesterday affects me today. What happened five, ten years ago affects me today. Our world at any given moment in time, and includes such things as gender, physical skills, genetic inheritance, and cultural artifacts we are born into and have adapted, are adopted, such as institutions, language. It includes our background, how we are raised, and the formative influences in our life. It's that which is given rather than chosen. The third concept is verfallen. It's to act or drift in the present. It means ensnarement or entanglement of the present. Fallenness or falling prey to the world is that state of being in which the person is absorbed and entangled in idle talk, ambiguity, and curiosity that is in the everyday task of being. So at any given time, we have three influences from three different directions. We have the past, or what Heidegger called facticity. We have the present, verfolen, the things that are happening in the here and now. And then we have existence, our becoming. And all the time, this is a moving target. All along, we're moving forward in time, and these circumstances are changing. So let's take it one step further and look at the factors that impact the clients that we work with. We have the environment, and that can be any number of things, and it can be multiple environments. For example, a child could have one environment at home, another environment at school. We have our age, economic situation, cognitive ability, our biology, gender, institutions and organizations such as work, church, synagogue, or mosque. All these things are different systems that are impacting a person, a couple, a family, or a group, or even a community at any, any given time. Systems theory is concerned with the interaction among systems. Systems theory was well along in replacing psychodynamic theory in the 1960s as the main paradigm for social work practice and continues as a dominant idea with human services which began to emerge as a separate profession in the 1960s. So you could conclude that for human services, systems theory has, has and continues to be the dominant theoretical perspective. So what are some properties or characteristics of systems? Well, for one thing, a system is a group of interacting parts functioning as a whole. It's also something that's distinguishable from its surroundings by recognizable boundaries. 
When a series of parts are connected into various configurations, the resultant system no longer exhibits the collective properties of the parts themselves. Instead, any additional behavior attributed to the system is an example of an emergent system property. For example, a computer is a lot of very different parts and components. Now, those parts and components by themselves can't do anything. But when you put all those parts together, the keyboard, the monitor, the different chips, the different memory, all these complex parts, the wiring, the, the cooling component that's used, the software, the hardware, when it all comes together, you have something that's useful. You have a system, a computer system, that consists of subsystems. Here's an example that has to do with people instead of computers. I can have two separate people who each constitute a separate system. Let's say Bill and Karen. Bill and Karen are separate systems, but they get together in some kind of a relationship. And that relationship is itself a third system. Now, the two systems that it's composed of are Bill and Karen, but that doesn't negate the fact that Bill and Karen getting together in a relationship forms a third system. I've referred to the concept of boundaries a couple of times already. Now it's time to define it. A boundary is the qualities, resources, or elements that bound the system together, separating it from external elements or from other systems. Theoretically, boundaries range from closed to open. Let's talk about a closed system. In a closed system, there's no interchange across the boundary. The boundary is sealed. Now, a closed system is a theoretical concept. I don't think, in reality, there's any such thing in a system that's completely closed. Let me give you an example of a potential closed system. Let's say a rock. We have a rock, and we drop water onto it every three seconds, just a drop of water, but relentlessly every three seconds for a very long period of time. Now, in a few hours or a few days, we're not going to see any effect. But I bet you, if we looked microscopically, within a week, we'd begin to see an effect. And within months or years, those drops of water dropped every three seconds would indeed begin to penetrate that boundary. But a rock's a pretty good example of a system that's closed from the outside world. Now let's talk about an open system. An open system is a system where energy passes through a boundary. Now then again, this is a theoretical construct, like the closed system. In real life, there's no system that's completely open. There's always some kind of boundary, just as there's no system that's probably completely closed in real life. My favorite example, though, of an open system is a tea bag. A tea bag certainly has a boundary, but it's a thin piece of tissue paper. If I take that tea bag and I put it in water, the tea bag remains a complete system, but yet that water passes in and out. The molecules pass in and out and through the tea, and pretty soon, as you well know, that water will begin to change color, and you have two systems, the glass of water and the tea bag that are interacting with each other. So a tea bag is an example of an open system. Now, what are some examples of other open systems? People are open systems. We hear and learn and interact with our environment, and energy passes from our environment through us in some ways, and we are open systems, open to the environment that we're in. Energy passes from the environment through the boundary at the interface. The interface is a simple concept. It is merely the point of contact between the system and input. Input. Input is energy crossing through the boundary into the system. Input is that energy which crosses the boundary into a system. Our environment is rich with sources of input that are both natural and cultural. Our senses are used to gather input. Education is a formalized form of input where learning, a form of energy in systems theory terms, is presented to the student. Food is another source of input. People receive all kinds of input from other people, which helps us to shape our perception, for better or worse, of who and what we are. Throughput. 
Throughput is how the energy is utilized within a system. Energy coming into a system is both transformed by the system and transforming to the system. It is used, interpreted, converted, or assimilated in some way, but never stays exactly the same as it was before it came in. Output. Output is the energy that passes out of the system into the environment. So, input is the energy that passes into the system through the boundary. Throughput is that energy as it is used up, absorbed, transformed by the system. Output is that energy as it comes out and interacts somehow with the environment. Feedback is a form of output that is reflected or redirected bounced off of the environment back into the system as new input. The system receives information or feedback about its performance and that information is in systems theory terms energy which is redirected back into the system as new input or feedback. Here's an example of feedback. You attend class and read the text somewhat haphazardly. That is your input. Your brain assimilates that information, files it away, and connects it to other knowledge and information that you have in your mind. That is throughput. You take a test. That would be output, but do not do well. The results of that test is your feedback. The previous example of a low test score is one example of negative feedback. Negative feedback is feedback that directs the system back to homeostasis. We will define homeostasis in a moment. Positive feedback. Positive feedback is input that tells the system that it is operating correctly. Rewards and praise are just some examples. A raise and positive evaluations at work would be an example of positive feedback for one system, the job, is rewarding another system for behaviors that it considers favorably. It is common for the same behavior to elicit both positive and negative feedback from different aspects of the environment or from different systems. A teenager may receive positive feedback from smoking cigarettes from one group of peers and negative feedback about that behavior from other peer groups as well as most adults. Homeostasis. Homeostasis equals equilibrium. It's the ability for a system to maintain fundamental nature despite input. This does not mean that change does not occur to a system because it does. It does mean that change, external or internal, does not overwhelm the system, or at least the system tries to keep it from overwhelming it. Systems seek homeostasis. That is one reason why persons in abusive relationships have difficulty in leaving that relationship. Although some people are more adventurous than most, a large part of our preferences are for the comfort of the familiar. Systems struggle, sometimes in vain, to maintain sameness or equilibrium with varying degrees of success. Chaos theory is a derivative of systems theory that deals with systems that are overwhelmed by input and forced out of equilibrium. As a matter of fact, a crisis could be considered a situation in which a system is overwhelmed by events and is not able to remain stable. Differentiation. Differentiation is a seminal concept in systems theory. Every system moves from simple to complex. The development of the human zygote to an embryo and then a fetus and then into an infant is an example of how we move and develop from the simple interaction between sperm and egg into a much more complex human being. As we mature, we become more complex. So do institutions and groups. Early relationships are characterized by their paucity of complexity, but as our relationships mature, they acquire more history, nuances, and in a word, become much more complex than they used to be. Religions follow the same pattern. Early Judaism, Christianity, and Islam were less complex than their more modern counterparts. 
organizations move from simplicity to complexity as they mature following the same pattern as any other kind of system. You yourself are much more complex now than you were, say, five years ago. More has happened to you, you have more experience, and are influenced by more things than you were at an earlier age. Non-summativity is another systems theory concept. It's also called sometimes synergy. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Non-summativity -sum means literally no sum. Reciprocity, the idea that change in one part of the system reverberates throughout the system. Reciprocity is the idea that changing one part of a system will have an effect on other parts of the system as that energy reverberates throughout the system. It is analogous to a ripple effect. This is a powerful concept of working with client systems. It means that we do not always have to start where we want to be to get the desired effect. Systems theory is closely related to ecological theory, and chaos theory is considered an extension or a refinement of systems theory. Catastrophe theory deals with the properties of a system after it has passed through chaos into a state of catastrophe. Chaos theory deals with the behavior of systems when they become chaotic and nonlinear. A detailed discussion of chaos theory is beyond what I'm going to discuss in this lecture. Catastrophe theory is concerned with the process of a sudden, often violent, breakdown of a system. Pause and think for a moment about what might be some examples of systems that have gone into a state of chaos or catastrophe. The ecological perspective, or ecological theory, has its origins in the science of ecology. In social work and human services, it is an attempt to expand the concepts of systems theory from an organic or ecological perspective. The terms ecological perspective and ecosystems theory are relatively interchangeable, referring to an approach for analyzing people and other living things and their transactions. I'm now going to define seven ecological perspective terms. Social environment is the conditions, circumstances, and human interactions that surround our existence. Transactions is something communicated or exchanged. Energy, natural power of active involvement. Interface, similar to that in systems theory. Adaptation is the capacity to adjust to surrounding environmental conditions. Coping, adaptation that requires a struggle. And then finally, interdependence, which in ecological perspective terms, terms means mutual reliance. Interface, adaptation, and coping are concepts unique to the e ecological perspective and provide some very useful ways to think about how people interact with each other and their environment. In regard to human beings, system size is often broken down into three levels. Micro refers to the individual. Meso refers to small groups that could also be families. Macro refers to larger groups. Systems can be seen as having the characteristics of Russian nesting dolls, where one small doll fits inside a bigger one and then those two dolls fit inside yet another bigger doll, and so on. A microsystem can reside in a mesosystem, and a mesosystem can reside in a macro system. So what can we conclude from all this so far? The shadow of one thing falls on another. A person's social status affects their economic status. The economic status affects their biological status. The biological status affects their physio physiological well-being. And all of these factors are influenced by environmental influences at all levels, micro, meso, and macro. In human services practice, the client can be an individual, couple, family, group, community, organization. In other words, we can have clients that are microsystems, mesosystems, or macrosystems. By the way, macro practice is usually also known as community practice or community organization. 
Human service workers should not ignore other systems to deal just with the presenting problem and its representative symptom. The systems are often interrelated and one thing has an impact on another. The following slide illustrates this. Let's say that we have a client by the name of Bill. Bill comes in and it's obvious that he has a physiological depression. Well, that physio physiological depression causes suppressed appetite and sleep disturbance. His physiological depression causes him to be isolated and to isolate himself from others. That leads to failing work and school performance. So you can see how one thing, physiological depression, can cause a chain reaction or reciprocity throughout the system. Bill's depression does not occur by itself. <coughs> Systems affect each other. Distress in one system pushes other elements causing reciprocity. In other words, one bad thing can lead to another. Fortunately for us, this can work both ways. Intervention in one area can bring relief in another area. A person successfully undergoing treatment for substance abuse can experience increased functioning at work and within their family. Can we overcome our environment? That's an important question for those of us working in this field. And the answer is yes to a point. Environmental factors are analogous to the current of a river. They constitute a trend or pressure that go in one direction. Instead of drifting, we can consciously make an effort to move in other directions. Your clients can consciously make a decision to move in other directions but it'll be a decision they have to make on their own. You can't do it for them. 